The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, a continuation of the story of last week. Listen now for God's word to you. And then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of Jesus and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And Jesus said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three and a half years and there was famine over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow at Seraphath in Sidon. And there were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Now when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. And they got up and drove Jesus out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But Jesus passed through the midst of them and went on his way. May the Lord bless unto us the reading of Scripture, Gospel, the Epistle. To God be glory, dominion, and might, world without end. Amen. Don't call the office. I know that was a misprint in the bulletin. And Donald played it correctly. But usually we sing the last verse of the first one we sang. But uh, thanks for saving my bacon on that, Donald. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I guess every small town throughout the United States wants notoriety for something. Oftentimes, especially in the state of Texas, it's their football team. How many times have you uh, driven through a small town in the state of Texas and it said, home of the Bearcats or home of the Hornets? I remember I was driving through a town named Winter, Texas, in its southeast of Abilene. We were on our way to Colorado, and the bank sign said, Winter, home of the blizzards. And underneath it had the temperature of 105 degrees. I thought, you know, what irony. If it's not their sports team, then it's one of the city's or town's favorite sons or daughters that's mentioned. I got lost on my way back from Colorado and went through a town named Turkey, Texas. Home of Bob Wills. If you don't know who Bob Wills, go look it up. Great Texan and great Texas swing music. Abbott, Texas, on the way up to uh, Dallas, home of Willie Nelson. In Arkansas, Hope, Arkansas, home of former President William Jefferson Clinton. 
Now, if they had had signs in the days of Jesus, when you entered Nazareth, it would say, Nazareth, home of the great prophet, Jesus. And crowds will turn out for hometown heroes of native sons or daughters who have made the big time or big time in the town's opinion. Jesus' fame was spreading throughout all of Israel and Judea. And he arrives at the synagogue. His reputation precedes him. People when are on the edge of their seat when the scroll is handed to them, to him. They can't wait to hear what he says. And the sermon begins well enough. I came to preach good news to the poor, to give sight to the blind, release to the captives, freedom to the oppressed, and it's a, and announce that God's good favor. In other words, God has not forgotten you. God's good favor is with you, and that you're hearing it, it is true. And you could just see, ooh, he is really good. And the Jewish mother with a daughter of marriageable age elbows her. How about that one? How can he speak with such authority? Isn't this Joseph's son? Where did he learn to read? And where does this great gift come from? In my profession, there are things called, we call safe sermons. Safe sermons are sermons that the, the preacher deliberately sidesteps hot spots or things that punch the congregate's buttons to irritate them. And safe sermons go out of their way not to offend another person. Now, in a way, I can kind of relate to Jesus' plight. During the ages of 10 through 16, I grew up in a small town in northern Louisiana. And that was 1962 to 1968. And we worshipped at my father's parish, the only Presbyterian church in this small town. And they did have a weekly newspaper. As a matter of fact, stored somewhere in my mother-in-law's house is the full front page of the day I got married. Richard not married. But it was like World War II has happened. Uh, and, and the whole picture of, of my wife and, and telling every elaborate detail they could. It was the biggest news that had hit the town. Or either they were announcing a miracle that he got married. Well, my uncle died. And I was to preside over the funeral in the Presbyterian church where my father had been pastor. And evidently, a word got out that I was coming home. I had not been in that town, at least lived in that town for 50 years. I didn't really know what I was going to say. But I did remember from 1962 to 1968, that was the most prejudiced and bigoted town I had ever lived in. When my parents retired and moved back for a little while, it had not changed. 
they finally left. They could not put up with the mindset. Now, fortunately for me, I was to only talk about my uncle. What would Jesus do? Let me tell you what he would do. He preaches to his hometown. And he does that which is very unwise. He spoke the truth. Truth is dangerous, unsettling. It stirs a lot of raw emotions in individuals. And what he was addressing was basically about their religious pilgrimage. Your religion is a way of hiding the true self. Your religion is a facade that you put on and take off. Now, how do I come up with that? Because of the sermon. Jesus gets down to brass tacks and says, Were there no widows in Israel? When that three and a half year famine came, but the great prophet Elijah feeds a Gentile widow. Not a Jewish widow, but a Gentile widow. Widow. Were there no lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha? And who did Elisha cleanse from leprosy? Not one Israelite, but a a military leader of the Syrian army. Bitter enemies. What he's telling them is, my hometown people, you're hiding behind your religion. You have changed your religion to accommodate your prejudices and your pride. Your religion has now become an extension of corruption in your heart. A justification for your hatred of people who are different than you are. Instead of a God who changes you at the deepest level of your being, you have adopted a different concept of God who becomes an extension of a soul that is sick. Now, how do they respond? If this had been in Nazareth, Texas, someone would have shouted out, get a rope. Hang him from a tree. But ropes were expensive in those days, and so they dragged him out of the synagogue and tried to throw him off the hill over a cliff. And there was so much confusion, backbiting, that he was able to walk right through the middle of them. Total chaos. You know, the truth is hard to hear. Now, I like the truth about other people. That's human. 
They are the problem. They're what's wrong with the world. That group over there. But the truth destroys that wall between them and us. The truth tells us that when we vilify another individual or group of people, we ourselves become the villains. It takes one to know one. A memorable movie, a motion picture that I recall. Now, Tom Cruise, I'm sorry, Phil, I know he doesn't like Tom Cruise, but the part was well written. Tom Cruise is working for the JAG Corps of the United States Navy, and um, Jack Nicholson is a full bird colonel of the Marine Corps. And Jack Nicholson has ordered the abuse of one of the Marines that couldn't hack it and lets the blame fall on a corporal and a sergeant. And in the court review, Cruz's character... starts shouting at the colonel, which was a dangerous position. And Colonel Jess, what do you want from me? I want the truth. And Jessup says this, you can't handle the truth. That stuck with me. struck me in a way. Maybe we can handle the truth, but maybe we prefer not to. Getting to the truth is tough, dirty work. A former member of this church and a dean at Oklahoma State University, a ruling elder, and a Baptist minister until he saw the light, gave me a book. And the title of the book was Learning to Sell to tell myself the truth about myself. And that book, to work through it, was tough. Let me tell you something you may not want to hear. Some of the worst people to tell themselves the truth about themselves are the very religious, especially the clergy. You don't want to hear that, but it's the truth. Oh, we're, we're good about proclaiming the truth. The problem's outside of us, you see. We don't have to worry about ourselves like we, uh, God and I are close, right? No. Clergy, clerical temptation is to wash our vestments in the laundry soap of good deeds and well-preached sermons. But behind those vestments, it is so easy to become impervious to the movement of God's Spirit in our lives. After all, 
We've been to school. My goodness, we learned to read Greek and Hebrew. It has taken me years and years to take this pilgrimage to the point where I am willing to tell the truth to myself. I don't want to turn the other cheek. I would prefer to return evil for evil. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. Do not retaliate. When I examine myself, I say, I am not there. But by golly, that's a heavy burden to carry, isn't it? And I had to tell myself the truth about myself. If I wanted to take the gospel to take root in me, I must own the fact that my natural being is not to love. Now, I love all of you. But if you were to come up to me 10 years ago and say, that was the worst sermon I ever heard. I don't know. I'm not a finished product. God is continuing to reveal to me that the greatest of all gifts is what Phil read. The greatest is love. You can't manufacture that. It is a gift. It is given. If you will receive it. Truth for me so long was a different theological nuance, a twist to the text. But I think what Jesus is talking about here is for all who would hear it. That if you find after looking inwardly that you are poor in spirit, that you are, have been blind to, to that person you are, and you are held in bondage and captivity in any way, shape, form, or fashion, you are held in chains that you have created link by link. Because we become so obsessed with ourselves. When you realize that, the sermon Jesus preached becomes, turns from bad news and become good news. I wonder if anybody went out of that sermon and said, boy, he really nailed me. I need some help. From the reaction of the crowd, I don't think so. The beginning of the Christian pilgrimage is the admission that we're not like Christ. And that's the first step to being made whole. And Christian maturity will take the path that our worst enemy 
It's not out there. It's in here. And when we realize that, then God can set us free. Or I'll tell you, it's a long process. So rejoice. There's good news. And that brings hope to your life and to mine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
Church USA as the ruling elders come forward now for the laying on of hands.